Hi, Democrats. Today is Thursday, September 21st, and it's time for the Chair's Daily Live. Happy Thursday. So yesterday, um, we were fortunate to have um, we, to have a sitting legislator join us, and John Waldron, uh, and talk about our superintendent of public instruction and the folly of um, him speaking in front of Congress and making stuff up and, and not being fact-checked. But today, and today, we're being joined by yet another sitting legislator and friend of the Chair's Daily Live, um, Mickey Dollins from Oklahoma City. Um, this week, Mickey has hosted an interim study. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what, what an interim study is. It's where legislators bring in subject matter experts to give background to other legislators about bills they pl plan to bring forward. So they're educating each other about the bills, you know, with uh, subject matter experts, stats and data, so that they're making reasonable common sense decisions about the bills that they pass. So uh, join me in welcoming Mickey Dollins. Alicia, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so very much. And so did I give a, a, a good enough explanation of what an interim study is? Yeah, I think that was really important to kick us off. I mean, a lot of times when people hear the word study, they think longitudinal study, where I think more of an appropriate word could be a presentation. A lot of times lawmakers will request an interim study or an interim presentation to prop up future legislation that they plan to introduce next year. And so in my case, I last week I had the opportunity to sit in a interim study, not hosted by me, but it was in my committee of elections and ethics, and it addressed ranked choice voting. And then just a couple of days ago, I got to actually host my own interim study, and that was on the ballot initiative process, how to strengthen it and how to safeguard it going forward. So the ballot initiative process is, is something I'm incredibly um, interested in because Oklahoma, this is one of the things that we do well. Oklahoma is one of 17 states, if I have it right, that still have this direct, direct democracy option available to us. And I hope that we keep it. Yeah, that's a great point. So there are three forms of direct democracy. There's election recalls, ballot initiatives, and veto referendums. Now, veto referendum is like what my seatmate Jason, Do Joe, <laughs> Jason Lowe did a couple of years ago when he attempted to gather enough signatures after Sine died to reverse the permitless carry bill. He did a phenomenal effort, but the, st the stakes are so high in the amount of signatures required that he came up just a little bit short. The other form is an election recall. Only nine states around the country have that. And I know that a lot of people in Oklahoma right now wish we were one of the nine, but essentially that gives citizens the power to recall an elected official if they feel like they're not doing their job. And the third form of direct democracy is the ballot initiative process. And there's actually a total of 26 states that have that, and we're lucky to be one of them. It's really interesting, Oklahoma being one of the reddest states in the entire country, but we tend to pass some of the more progressive laws thanks to the ballot initiative process. We have Medicaid expansion where more than 260,000 Oklahomans now have health insurance because of the will of the people. Would have never been touched if it were left up to the legislature. We have criminal justice reform because of the ballot initiative. And of course, medical marijuana, which brings in tens of millions of dollars into our state coffers. It's one reason why we have over $5 billion in uh, rainy day funds is because of that additional revenue. And it's really important that we safeguard that process. Uh, and in my, in my interim study, we looked at and we examined um, legislative tactics that GOP controlled states around the country have used to undermine the will of the people. And then at the end, I was able to make some recommendations on reforms in which ways that we can strengthen it and um, not only preserve the power of the people, but enhance it as well. So um, my, my internet is wonky. So my, my fear is that the majority, the majority in the legislature is trying to make it harder because they know that if they require, you know, a certain percentage of signatures to come from every single county, that it will be less successful. Do I understand that right? Yeah, Alicia, and the tactic you were referring to is called geographic distribution. It's where they require, let's say, so many of the 77 counties to pass uh, by a threshold, or they require four out of the five congressional districts in order to pass. That was actually one of the recommended bills last year that was filed. 
The problem with that is that you could have all four districts across the state, congressional districts approve something, but there could be that one district that says, ah, we don't want to do it. And then the whole thing falls apart. Another common tactic that we're seeing in GOP controlled states is raising the threshold from a simple majority, which is 50% plus one. It's how me and every other representative and every other state senator from the state to federal level gets elected is by a simple majority. But they want to make ballot initiatives a 60% majority. That makes it extremely difficult. That's like if OU and Texas played a football game and OU scored 59 points and Texas put up 41. Under that logic, Texas would win the game. Uh, a foundational cornerstone of our democracy is one person, one vote, simple majority rules. Okay, so have you seen any bills kind of floating around um, that the majority is trying to put up to um, it prohibit or to inhibit um, ballot initiatives, to make it harder, this, this that, cycle? That's correct. Last year, there were five bills introduced that would have made the ballot initiative process much more difficult. One of those bills advanced, and that was by Senator Julie Daniels from Bartlesville. And that would have added a $750 filing fee, and it would have also have increased the protest period from 10 days to 20 days. That's basically a challenge period where anyone can say, hey, we want to challenge this. And essentially what it does is it delays the process in getting onto the ballot. Also, the $750 filing fee is cost prohibitive. In our state's constitution, we are actually, Oklahoma is the only state in the entire country where we put the direct democracy of the ballot initiative directly into the state constitution in 1907. It is inherently Oklahoma. We've never had a national vote, but in 1907, there's a, a state, there's a U.S. representative from Oklahoma named Elmer who attempted to get it through federal federally, and he was unsuccessful. And then I think it was attempted again in 1977. But there's never been a national vote, but there are 26 states that have the ballot initiative process. And so you have geographical distributions, which make it diff more difficult. And then you have raising the threshold, adding a filing fee. And then also, um, I, I think there's a variation of the geographical distribution as well. Oh, yeah. Also signature requirements. So right now, in order to pass a, let's take medical marijuana, for example. That was a statutory amendment. So it required 8% of the total votes cast in the last gubernatorial election. If you want to make a change to the state constitution, like Medicaid expansion, for example, that requires 15% of the total votes cast in the last gubernatorial election. If you want to do a veto referendum, like my seatmate, Representative Jason Lowe, did a few years ago, then that requires 5% vote. 5% signatures of the total votes cast in the last gubernatorial election. And so by raising that threshold up, and also a key finding in my interim study, we brought in the National Conference of State Legislatures, NCSL, a nonpartisan group that compares different policies around the state. Oklahoma's 90-day window to collect over 100,000 signatures is by far the most difficult process in the entire state of any country of any state that has a ballot initiative process that 90 day limited window is very detrimental for rural oklahoma if we want petitioners out in rural oklahoma then we should expand that by at least 180 days if not one year that would give petitioners the opportunity to go to rural oklahoma to gather signatures and also get their input because as it is now with that limited 90 day window, you got to go where the people are. And that is in Tulsa and Oklahoma City. And not only would it increasing that window increase rural representation, it would also decrease financial influence, especially from out of state. In order to get a message out, you have to pay for media, print, you name it. That costs a lot of money. You can be more grassroots if you have more time. And that was one of the policy recommendations that I made to enhance and strengthen the ballot initiative process. Well, I like the part about giving rural Oklahomans more say in the process. The, that 90 day window limits, I mean, it truly does limit how much petitioners are going into rural communities because they're concentrating where there's a dense number of people. And yeah. so that process feels like it disenfranchises rural Oklahomans. You're absolutely correct. Is there any, this is me hoping, is there any bipartisan support for uh, retaining the ballot initiative process at its level now or making it um, easier uh, to get across the finish line? 
you know, in any legislation that I examine or introduce, I look for to build bridges with my Republican colleagues, because frankly, that's about the only way you're going to get legislation passed. And we were able to examine a reform that had very strong bipartisan support in the interim study. The FEC a couple years ago um, had a gap, a loophole in a law that did not, does not prohibit um, outside influence from different countries from spending in state ballot initiatives uh, elections. Uh, I think that in order to protect the integrity and the uh, will of what the grassroots nature of a ballot initiative is, we should prohibit out of country influence when it comes to campaign spending in ballot initiatives. That was one of them. Also one that had pretty good support was considering electronic signatures. Now we'd still have people out on, in the field collecting signatures in communities so they're able to talk to people if they have questions. But in this day and age in Oklahoma where people can sign up to register online as a voter, why can't they be able to sign their signature, what, sign their name on a petition on an iPad or a smartphone in order to even have the opportunity to get a state question on the ballot? Not only does this uh, increase efficiency, it'll save hundreds of thousands of dollars to the state of Oklahoma. As it is right now, we have a broken verification process. By collecting electronic signatures, we could verify on the spot that this is a valid voter. And then the, the people collecting signatures don't have to spend tens of thousands of, of dollars on specific card stock weight of the paper. Uh, it makes it much more efficient and it brings it back to the 21st century. So I like electronic signatures. Um, I like the expanding the 90 day period. And then the third one that I recommended is that the Secretary of State should have a deadline on how long it takes to verify signatures. And we must have a designated date where all ballot initiative questions get on the ballot, state questions get on the ballot. As you know, right now, the governor has unilateral power to pick any arbitrary date, let's say August 8th, nothing else going on in the state. And oftentimes, unfortunately, that's used as a legislative tactic to stall a state question because of low voter turnout. If we designated, for example, uh, every state question that earned enough signatures is going to go on the next general election, then we're ensuring that the most people turn out to vote so it will be more accepted by the majority of Oklahomans. And you're not going to have petitioners who have put their blood, sweat and tears in collecting signatures only to get pushed off on some arbitrary date that they can just feel hopeless and defeated. You're making sure that the most people show up. And also, did you know a special election costs the state of Oklahoma taxpayers over a million dollars? So you're increasing voter turnout, you're getting better representation, and you're saving the state over a million dollars by designating state questions be on the general election only. Well, it sounds like you've thought this out. And, you know, like I said, this is voting is, is my bailiwick. Like, it's the thing that I care the most about. And so I, I appreciate you agreeing to come on. I appreciate you being so thorough and presenting it so clearly. Um, and for those people who are out there who are interested in ranked choice voting, protecting the ballot initiative process is, is probably the only way we're ever going to see that on our ballot. Correct? That's correct. There are many different issues that are uh, possible with the ballot initiative. You mentioned ranked choice voting, campaign finance reform, ending gerrymandering, all issues that are possible through the ballot initiative. I was in the ranked choice voting committee um, oh, about a week ago, and ultimately the Republicans decided that it would be best to just blanket ban ranked choice voting across the state. I think that's terrible, especially for a party that prides itself on local control. Oftentimes, states that implement ranked choice voting at the state level, it starts at the municipal level. Now, granted, uh, Secretary Xerox, one of the best in the entire country, if not the best at running elections, he admitted that our voting machines are old. They cannot accommodate RCV right now, ranked choice voting, but we are due for an upgrade. In the next three to four years, we're going to be having to buy new voting machines. And all of the new voting machines that are being rolled out on the market today can accommodate ranked choice voting. So for the GOP to say, uh-uh, we're not going to do it exactly like they did with municipalities prohibiting them from raising local minimum wage by putting a blanket ban on RCV is, uh, is, is not good for anyone. It's especially not good for democracy. And these are local elected officials. They have a right. And constitutionally, there's nothing wrong with it. It's completely legal. But to say you can't do it is just overly punitive and way too controlling. Well, I, I love the fact that that 
some things um, the Republicans say that they like local control and some things they insist on controlling uh, at 23rd and Lincoln. That seems to be the pa the pattern. They're all for local control until they aren't. <laughs> all righty. Thank you so very much for joining me and being so thorough. Um, and for those who've joined me, whether you're watching live or you're watching later, thank you. Please share this because it's an important topic. We need everybody to know the importance of the ballot initiative process and how it's under attack. Um, and you guys have a wonderful day. And I'll be back here tomorrow at 415. Sounds good. Thank you.